Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks especially for coming at an odd time uh, to this week's CETA seminar. So I'm really pleased to introduce Tasia. Um, I've known Tasia since grad school. Uh, so Tasia graduated uh, from Caltech in 2015. His PhD advisor was Chris Serrata. Uh, after that, he went on to the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, where he has been a fellow ever since. Um, Tasia has worked on a broad array of topics in cosmology and theoretical astrophysics. And um, lately, he's been investigating strong lensing, both of gravitational waves and also, as he'll discuss, uh, visible light. So uh, Tej has been here all week. He will be leaving after today. So if you missed your chance to talk to him, do that. Uh, but uh, maybe he can still see us part of his time before he's come. Take it away today. OK. So first, I'd like to thank Aaron for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, so I can begin. So I'll be talking about caustic crossing events in galaxy clusters today. So most of the talk, so it will be about strong lensing. And I assume that not everyone here thinks about it all the time. So I'll try to give a decent introduction to it and then talk about the subject of this. Right. So my collaborators on this work have been Liang, who is another postdoc at the IAS, and uh, Jordi Miralda, who is in Barcelona. So this, this work, the talk is based on a paper which came out last week. So this is the first time I'm talking about it. So if there are some rough edges, you know, sorry about that. And also the. This is slightly different from other talks I've given, since I'll be flitting between some observations and theory. And but I'll focus more on explaining the general theory of you know the phenomenon that is a, you know we think has been observed, and not the particular observation which I'll use to motivate it. Okay, so let's begin. So. Since now it's a law of nature that every talk has to have a gravitational waveform, <laughs> I have one here. But this talk is not going to be about gravitational waves. It is about an another of the great predictions of general relativity. In fact, the maybe the f one of the first or the first observation that you know to the general public it confirmed its validity. So this is the new. This is a picture that appeared in 1919 after Eddington's expedition, where they observed the deflection of starlight due to the gravitational field of the sun, and it's a rather nice picture. But uh, this is only. So this is related to lensing, but this is only part of the story. So I'll explain a bit further. You know, about the other unique aspects of strong lensing. So this is what you would call maybe weak lensing. So, right. So, as always, maybe it's good to have a slight historical perspective. So, interestingly enough, so Einstein's notes have, you know, the, he's worked out the phenomenon of lensing in 1912, and then abandoned it as being unobservable and didn't do anything about it for a while while other people you know independently proposed it later but you no know, the first publication on it was by einstein in 1936 and the story about why he waited from 12 to 36 is a bit interesting because he had left it thinking it's unobservable but then you know a certain R.W. Mandel, Rudy Mandel, paid him a visit at the IAS. And so I read about Mandel. It, so Cliff Will says he's an electrical engineer. But a, a popular article, which dug in a bit deeper, found that he had been trained as an electrical engineer. But when he talked to Einstein, he was working as a busboy and dishwasher in a restaurant. But he was somehow deeply interested in optics and general relativity, read about it, and then came to Einstein trying to convince him that this is something interesting. And 
but since he was not formally trained, he had strange ideas that the focusing of starlight could have caused mass extinctions because of enhanced mutations. So, and Einstein convinced him that that was not the case. And then he convinced Einstein to publish his results. So he wrote up this paper in 1936. This is sort of, sort of interesting, right? And as in the paper, he says, of course, there is no hope of observing this phenomenon directly. And then he says, you know, we, the impact parameters are not achievable and we'll never resolve it, which is turned out not to be true. So Zwicky very quickly later realized that the mo galaxies are powerful gravitation, can be powerful gravitational lenses and they can be massive enough to have observable effects. Also an interesting thing is, uh, so he says that he was asked to publish upon this by Zvorikin, who is one of the inventors of the TV. Apparently, Mandel also went to Zvorikin and tried to tell him about his extinction theories, I think. <laughs> anyway, so back to lensing. So what is lensing, right? So maybe the most general perspective on it will come from, uh, is, is to look at it as an illustration of Fermat's principle. So here we have a source S and an observer O. So the line is the observer's word line. So it's his, it's a slice, it's a projection of his position as a function of time. And so if you, if the source S emits some radiation, so Fermat's principle tells how it propagates to the observer's world line O. And so the radiation is, it propagates on null rays, but not all null rays, so, but it doesn't propagate along all null rays. So Fermat's principle says that it takes the path of least time and more mathematically, if you take Fermat's principle, which says that you are at a local extremum of the time delay between the source and the moment of observation. It's mathematically equivalent to saying that it propagates along the geodesic. It so happens that, so the unique thing about strong lensing is that there are multiple extrema of the time delay. So the time delay surface is, is not just a Gaussian with a single minimum, but it has multiple extrema. And that is because of the global properties of the space-time that the radiation is propagating in. So to illustrate it a bit more clearly, here is the same picture again with the source and the word line of the observer. And so there is a mass in between which I have denoted L as the lens, and it has its own word line. And it modifies the geodesics of space-time in such a way that there are multiple geodesics that start from the, from the source S and intersect the world line of the observer O. So our expectations, of, such as in Minkowski spacetime, a light cone emitted from an event intersects a given world line only once. So because of the presence, because of the deformation of spacetime due to the presence of the lens, the light cone intersects the observer's world line multiple times. Right. So this is just many ways of saying the same thing, just to fix it in your mind. So let's ha have some definitions. So this is the same picture as earlier. There is a source star, and then there is a lens, and there is an observer, and you have a deflection because of the presence of the lens. The geodesics are deflected, and because of that, the apparent position of the source, as seen by the observer, is different, but not by the deflection angle, but by a different angle. So there is one thing which is slightly different about this lens as compared to the usual convex lenses that we think about, which is that so the convex lenses, when they form an image, the entire so light propagates all the light rays that start from the source, hit the lens plane, and meet the observer within the area of the lens. They all have the same time delay, but here. They all have different time delays, but there are certain minima which have locally they are sorry minima or maxima or saddle points around which it's locally flat, but they all have different time delays. So it's not exactly a lens in the sense of optics. But so the equations of lensing are very simple, 
right so you just relate the observed position of the so of of the source as seen by the observer to the real position through the deflection angle alpha and since they are occurring at different locations you have to scale them with the distances so the scaled ones follow you know you can just it's just a implicit equation because the alpha the deflection alpha and the position x are all defined on the image plane or the lens plane and you have to solve for all positions all roots of this equation given a particular source position y right and so formally the deflection angle is the gradient of so called fermat potential and the time delay is a function of this fermat potential and i'll explain in a bit how this fermat potential is fixed so there are uh, Fine. there are a, a small and countable number of images say, and each image is defined by a position as seen by the observer that is x a time delay tau which is relative to some fiducial value and these extra quantities which are called magnification and shear so these are differential quantities this tell you so the images is a function images are defined for a point source right and then these tell you how these images move when you move the source around so these are differential quantities so they are defined by this so called jacobian matrix which tell you how the solutions of the lens equation change when you move the source around except this is the inverse so you have a 2 by 2 matrix since each each of them is a vector right and the 2 by 2 matrix can be decomposed into its irreducible parts which which are a convergence so called convergence kappa and a shear matrix gamma right there is no rotation in simple lensing single plane lensing so this convergence kappa is actually just the projected surface mass onto this plane scaled with some redshift factors and through solving the poisson equation given a certain function kappa you get the deflection potential or the fermat potential psi through which you get the deflection angles right and the determinant of this matrix is the inverse of the magn so called magnification and why is that so this illustrates why that just the magnification so this says if you have a given pixel on the source plane which has an area as so this pixel is image to one of the images each image each image of a point source within this pixel is image to some point source within this larger pixel al say and the magnification is the ratio of the area of this pixel to the area of this pixel right and one of the funny things about lensing is that this magnification can go to infinity at certain points so before it we see so this magnification is a purely geometrical quantity because solving it is just you just do some vector algebra and so it does not change any frequency any of the frequencies of the emitted radiation in this in this simple limit so you have one of the funny things as i mentioned is that the magnification can go to infinity so it goes to infinity at certain points so the locus of the points on the source plane where the magnification goes to infinity is the caustic and the caustics are image to points on called critical uh, uh, curves called critical curves on the image plane so uh, if you remember the magnification and the ma matrix is defined on the image plane so the really what happens is you take the locus of the points where the magnification is zero is infinite on the image plane and they are mapped to caustics on the source plane because it's one one going this way but not going this way right and what does it mean when the magnification goes to infinity any real source of course does not appear infinitely magnified then you start to see then you start to see the fact that the it's not just the simple jacobian there are higher derivative terms which lead to so called finite size effects which means that the magnification is regulated by the size of the source so the pixel is not a delta function right and you also can have in special cases diffraction where you start to see the fact that really this geometrical picture is just an approximation to an underlying wave equation you know and underlying 
path integral describing the motion of a wave. Right? So I'll just give you an illustration of these caustics and critical curves. The first simplest and maybe slightly degenerate version is when the lens takes the form of a delta function. So it's a point mass. So, so you can, I'll play this movie again. So this movie shows on the source plane, the star is you know, moving on the source plane. And the lens is fixed at the origin on the image plane. And this shows it's the image of this circle as the function of the source's position. Oops. So you can see that, so in this case, it's a degenerate case because the caustic actually degenerates to a single point. So the caustic of a point lens is a single point and it is mapped to a critical curve, which is a circle. So this is the so-called Einstein ring. So if a source is exactly aligned with the lens and there is and there is nothing else that is perturbing it, then it is imaged to a big circle, right? So that's the Einstein ring. And in, in general, you will almost never find a case where you just have circular symmetry. There's always some external perturbation. So this thing is an idealized case. And here I'm, I'll show you an example of a lens model where the, you don't have this circular symmetry and you can see some crazy things happen. So this is the same thing again. So except I have added an ellipticity to the mass distribution and made it extended. And this shows the images as a function of the source position again. So what has happened is that the caustic, which was earlier a single point, has, has now bifurcated into two branches. So one of the branches is this cost, you know, so the solid curves are caustic. So this is one caustic and this is another caustic and they are imaged to these critical curves, which are these dashed lines. So whenever the source crosses one of these caustics, the magnification goes to infinity. So you'll have one huge elongated image somewhere. And what really happens at these caustics is that new images are born as the source moves across the caustics. So if you, I'll play that movie again. For some reason in my presenter view, I can't play it, so I have to, wow. Sorry. So, so the source is going to cross this caustic and two images are born at a critical curve. They bifurcate and then when it crosses the other caustic, two images are again born here and it crosses it here, two images die here. And finally, only one image is left as the source moves to infinity, right? So it's a very complicated phenomenology, but uh, the underlying thing is very simple. So one of the beautiful things about lensing is that all these things are realized in nature. And this is actually maybe like the talk with the prettiest slides I've ever made, maybe. So not because of my effort, but it's just so nice. So this is, I've given here examples of various strong lensing systems which illustrate many of the things that I've talked about. So this is a case where the external shear is, is not very important and you have a case of, you know, where you have, it's nearly the idealized case of a point mass. So you see this beautiful Einstein ring here. So where the source is aligned with the lens, right? So this is a case where you don't have this circular symmetry. So you have a background quasar which has been imaged five times. You can see it one, two, three, four, five. Right? All of these images have different time delays, magnifications, and everything, right? So if you were to move that background quasar around, some of these would merge, become large, et cetera. Right? And another thing you observe, you might have observed is that the images, when they merge, because they are magnification goes to infinity, they become very long, elongated. So they are, these are the so-called giant arcs. So you can see this phenomenon here in this so-called, I think it was called the Cheshire cat. But you can see these beautiful arcs. 
So this is actually a system of two merging foreground galaxies, which are acting as lenses and produce these giant arcs because of the fortuitous alignment with background galaxies. And this is finally Abel 2218, which is one, one of the, these spectacular clusters, which you can see it's littered with many arcs, which are, you know, these streak, every one of these streaks is a background galaxy, which is being highly magnified. And in fact, many of them are like, you know, images of each other. So in fact, and that is used to reconstruct the lens mass distribution typically. So, yeah, so this is the lensing system that maybe I'll spend a bit more time in this talk. So this is in the constellation Leo. This is the, one of the Hubble Frontier Fields clusters. And it's at a redshift uh, half, redshift 0 0.5. So the, this is the brightest central galaxy. And I'll zoom in a bit more. Right. I'll zoom into this region, and I'll explain some recent observations of this region, which I haven't done or personally or haven't been involved in, but this you know, led to the subject of this talk. So this is a zoom in into the same region. Ignore the circle for now, right? So you know, into this region here. And so this is the brightest central galaxy, sorry, of the cluster. And this is another foreground galaxy. And this is a background galaxy at redshift 1.5, which is multiple image. So this is one image of this galaxy. This is another image of this galaxy here. Right. And this, this was uh, very famous a couple of years back, because you can see the so-called Einstein's cross. So what happened was there was a supernova that went off in this galaxy, and that supernova was multiply imaged. So these are four images of the supernova that were seen. And so this phenomenon of seeing you know, that any transient source will have multiple images with different time delays was one of the first people to point it out was uh, Sure Rafsdal. So in, it was named supernova Rafsdal in his honor. And one neat thing about this particular system is that they had very good lens models for this. So, real quick, the, this being lens in addition to the whole cluster by that, cal that four galaxy. Yeah, so, this, so this, these, these four are actually mainly because of the perturbation of this galaxy. And the, these images are because of the foreground, you know, cluster. Yeah, because of the cluster. So each of these should also have little dots like this, but with different time delays. And in fact, yeah, a spectacular thing that happened here was that there was a pred so this was observed in 2014, and the lens models predicted that uh, in December 2015 you would see uh, another image that would come out in this circle, and sure enough, it was here. So it did arrive, and you know, this was uh, you know rather spectacular observation, right? And it well at this point at, at you know, this particular observation, the best thing it would constrain would be the lens model, right? It, so different lens models actually predicted different arrival times because it's, it's, it's uh, not a perfect thing. You have to take into account the multiple images and try to fit them. But most of the models predicted that it would occur in December, and yes, it did happen. So I'll be talking about something else that happened in this cluster. So let's get to know the lens model a bit better. So this is, there are many lens models. So this is one lens model I picked. So this, ha so this has a few components. This, this, this idealizes the cluster as the sum of a few components. So the, in, the main thing to look at this is that the main brightest cluster member is around 10 to the 15 solar masses. So very, but there are multiple of halos that are merging and the, so this member galaxy C, so this is the galaxy that was, resp you know, that the cross was arranged around. It's an elliptical galaxy. So let's go back here, right? So, so this is the, I'm, I'm zooming out again. And here the white curve is the critical curve of, of this lens model. 
So it's the contour of the, if you recall, it's the contour where the magnification is infinite. And the, there's a small critical curve about the foreground the elliptical galaxy too, and the images are arranged around it, right? And the, yeah, so one of the interesting things about, so there was, there's another image of this galaxy here. And the prediction was that maybe around 40, 50 years back, I think there must have been a supernova there. But anyway, it's an interesting thing, right? So in observations that were taken of this cluster, in, partly in order to you know, see the supernova, they serendipitously saw something neat. So here I'm showing Again, so this is a 2011 image of the same region. It's a bit crappier because it's not co-added, right? So this is the foreground galaxy that the Einstein's cross came around, right? That's here, one, two, three, four. And there was a new knot that had popped up here, right? At here, which you can't see it very well, but it's, you know, it did change. and in when they observed this cluster again to look for this supernova, you know, that's the supernova which appeared here, they, this knot changed in flux, right? So it became brighter. So an interest, so I'm, I'm showing here the critical curves for the same cluster again. I've, so there are various lens models in the literature. I have plotted all the critical curves color coded so they're not they don't agree and i think since they have updated the models but the point is they all agree here right and the knot is here right i think when less small you mean different uh, mass distribution yeah well or different estimated mass distributions and the cluster is the same thing yeah right so the Basically, as well as the mo mo models can predict the critical curves, the transient is right on them, right? So this, if you remember the movie I showed of this source moving across the source plane and images popping into and out of existence. So it suggests that something like that is happening here, right? Where the background galaxy, which was multiply imaged, it's because of cosmological peculiar velocities, it's moving relative to this lens. And you know, so the, so the uh, hypothesis was that there's an individual star in the source galaxy at redshift 1.5, which was crossing the caustic of this lens model, and its images had brightened because since the star is not a delta function, it's, the magnification wasn't infinite, but this was the interpretation. So some, in, some you know, relevant points to, so this is a telegram that was published by the transient people asking for you know, people to observe this system if they had telescope time. So some interesting things is that, so yeah, they, they remarked that this is probably, an, in, it could be an individual star and they, they uh, based on the lens model, they estimated that it would reach a magnification of order 10 million over a, for a period of five to 10 hours, but rise slowly over a period of months to that point, and then die away. So this was the expectation. And also an interesting thing is that the, they had colors for this because it was so bright. and it seemed to fit a B star's uh, light from B star, right? So, bef so I'll maybe explain briefly how you calculate these numbers, right? So, to do that, let's abstract out this complicated lens model to, and so here I've shown this lens model here and the simple model I had shown earlier with the source at some point and a few images. And let's focus on some the vicinity of the critical curve. So that would be this box here or this box here. 
right? And on the source plane, that would be a small box on the source plane, which is in the vicinity of a caustic. And really, to understand this event, you only need to understand that little box, because the other images that are there, they're, you're not going to see those images of the star. They're not going to have very large magnifications. If you remember, the magnification is a property of every image. right? So all, all that we need to understand is this thing. So this is the so-called fold. The reason, it's, the reason it's called a fold is very simple. It's because the two images, that, so when the source crosses it, two images are born or die. So if you imagine a sheet of paper and you fold it on its side, right? So you'll see this curved thing. And imagine that you punch a pencil through it. And as you keep punching it successively as you approach the edge, the two images or the two points where, the, where you hit the surface, they approach each other. And then after a point, the pencil doesn't hit the paper anymore. So, so what's happening here is something like that, where the where the lens has changed the topology of you know the space time in its vicinity in such a way that it has folded the lens plane or image plane into the source plane it has performed this task for us so that's why it's called a fold so here i'm plotting here i'm showing this abstract fold so this is a source plane and this is the image or lens plane so on the source plane there is a caustic and the image plane, there's a critical curve. The origins are on both of them. And the source is here, which is approaching the caustic. Say. And it has, I just explained it, that there are two bright images near the critical curve. So, they are, so this source has two bright images, image one and two, which are whose separation goes to zero as the source crosses the caustic. And the images are elongated because the magnification, if even in you can see that the images are elongated, right? So that's because the magnification of each image is going to infinity. So one particular direction is being elongated arbitrarily largely, though it's not really arbitrarily large because of the lens model. But yes, so you see this elongated ellipses that will merge when the source crosses it. So this is the lens Jacobian again that I wrote out in an earlier slide. So there is the convergence and there is the shear. And so now what happens is you know that the magnification goes to infinity at this point. So you can expand this matrix around this point. So the, this entry, go, so say kappa plus lambda goes to, is one at that point. Say. So then it's, it's some linear function around that point. And the other eigenvalue is finite. In this direction, it, it's not elongated very much. So it's, it has some value, right? And the magnification to lowest order is the product of these two things for, sorry, the product of this eigenvalue and this entry. So it would be the one over the magnification is essentially linear with the separation, right? So it goes to zero at x is zero. So for a given source position y, if we ask what is the, how does the image position go? So a characteristic thing about caustics or fold caustics is that the image position is the, goes as the square root of the source position because it has to because you know that the, if it went linearly, it would have a finite derivative there. Right? So. So this is this is what causes it to become elongated, right? And so the total magnification, which is the sum of the magnification of this thing and this thing, is twice of each of the thing to lowest order, and it goes as one over the square root of the separation from the fold. So it goes to infinity on the fold. And right. So if we now ask, what does the magnification look like as a function of time? So this, if the so if there is just a linear velocity that, you know, is telling you how the source is moving across the source plane, then the offset goes linearly with time. So the magnification goes as one over square root of the of delta t. So this is a gen. I mean, the 
precise coefficients, they all depend on which the realization of the lens model, but this is a universal rule for fold caustics. And you'll see that also that to relate the source offset to time, you have to, you, so it's related by a certain velocity which and uh, angular diameter distance, and the velocity is built out of the velocities of the lens, the observer, and the source, all of them enter. So here, everything is relative to this observer. So both the source velocity and the lens velocity enter into this thing, right? So, so the magnification, as I said, goes as one over square root t, but it doesn't actually go to infinity because of the finite size. So this shows how the magnification departs from this, the point source value. So at large, so this t is like separations. So at large separations, it follows this one over square root t law. But then when you get close, it starts deviating because you start integrating over the brightness profile of the entire circle instead of disk instead of just a point. So the peak magnification that is reached, so that happens at grazing incidence when the edge of the star touches the caustic. So the peak magnification roughly goes as one over the square root of the radius of the star, right? So that's an important scaling. So it, and because the, it's roughly the projected radius, so it's roughly the length scale of the lens model, which is one over D. D is the gradient of this value. So it's roughly the length scale of the lens model divided by, by the angular size of the star and the square root of this value. So the lens model is typically, the, the one over D is typically like arc minute or you know few tens of arc seconds. And the star is pico arc seconds. It's, so that's why it's so large. So here the, so for this particular, so the, the, the precise numbers will change for different clusters, but the order of magnitude is the same. It will be around a million because of this disparity between the two lens scales that I mentioned. And also an interesting thing is that once the size of the source starts becoming important, the, the exact curve will actually not be, will start being chromatic. The reason is that different regions of the source can emit differently in different wavelengths. So for example, in a star, you have limb darkening. So where the edge, optical depth is different at the edges of the disk to, towards the center of the disk. And because of this, the, if you make the same curve based on different bands, it will start to differ. And that tells you something about limb darkening. So this sort of thing is actually seen not in clusters, but in you know, slightly more familiar systems in our galaxy. And the time scale of such, of this event, of, you know, for this, for, for where this turnover happens, is typically the time the star takes to cross its own radius. So it is roughly, or the diameter, so it's 2R over this velocity scale. And again, the precise numbers will differ, but it's order Rs. So if you remember the telegram, they said that it would take order Rs and reach magnifications of up to 10 million or so. So that's where you get these numbers from. But is this the whole story? So this would be really nice because this would be a really clean system and there is nothing else. You know, everything else has been made irrelevant by, the, by this huge magnification. But let's go back to that system and look at it again. So this is, let's forget this for a second. So this is the same image I showed earlier. So, so we took, sorry. I think part of the screen is being cut off. Okay. Anyway, so we, we took uh, a look at archival HST data of the same region. So this is, so the different or horizontal bars are different HST bands. And here I'm showing the flux of each pix of a few selected pixels. So this, the highest line is the BCG, the flux as a function of wa wavelength, and then, or the brightest central galaxy. And then you, if you move out a bit and pick a point at four kiloparsec away, you get this orange line. 
right? And then you take some a point which is 16 kiloparsec away, you get this yellow line. So the so you typically in such deep observations you have some zodiacal light, which is uh, inside the light from our galaxy that is polluting the observations, but the zodiacal light is constant over these scales. And the second thing is that this is at relatively high galactic latitudes, so it's not in the plane of our galaxy. So whatever is this light here is an, astro, is an astrophysical source, right? And this is, these are pixels which are practically empty pixels as far as the source detection algorithm goes. So, the, so here I have, so you, so the idea is that there are so this is a merge, this is a system with a bunch of clusters which are merging. So, and you can have these intra-cluster stars. So these are populations of stars that have been thrown out during this event, and they're filling space with some small density. So, and it's well, this is slightly, you know, it's not completely uh, set in stone, but. If you take a population that of old stars at a redshift a half, so this is how the SED looks like. So it and all of these look like rescaled copies of this SED. So it it's at least reasonable to ask that you know wonder whether there is a population of intercluster stars whose density is falling off as you move away from the cluster. So this is the same exercise but repeated around the pixel which brightened. So the important thing is that you see some UV flux at low wavelengths. So these old populations of stars don't have any UV flux. So the model is that these, this, these, the pixel, the UV flux is coming from the background galaxy, which is a young star forming galaxy. So that those are the blue curves and the red is the same thing. And then the, the measured brightness versus wavelength in that pixel is the sum of both of these and it is reasonably consistent with that. So also if you look at the scales, it's even less, so the red component is even lesser than this. That's because the pixel is for around 45 kiloparsec from, so from the BCG. So it's really not polluted very much by the BCG. So if we ask, if, if you take this putative population of intercluster stars and ask what is the, how much mass is in there, so you'll get that the foreground galaxy has a mass of, you can, it roughly corresponds to around a billion solar masses per arc sec, square arc second, while the, so this is project, so this is a pencil beam through the entire region, so and don't take the fact that this is greater than this too seriously because the angular diameter distance becomes larger. And if you ask what is the convergence because of this mass, you go through the math and you get that it is roughly 0 0.01. So the value of kappa because of these intracluster stars, you can estimate that it is roughly 0 0.01 and it turns out that there was all the observers also were doing this estimate and they got the roughly the same number so right so how does this 0.01 compare with the dark matter density in that region right so if you take the best fit model cluster one of the cluster models the value of kappa is around 0.8 at that point scaled with the critical value so that everything is dimensionless so roughly a, this sorry uh, roughly this would correspond to a percent of the mass density being in these free floating stars, right? And another number that might be good to note is the value of D, which is this gradient that determines the magnification that I mentioned. So this corresponds to a, scale, a typical length scale for the fold model of one over D of around 10, 10 to 12 arc second. Okay, so these are going to be important in what happens. So let's ask, if you take s such a system and put 1% of its mass in stars, what does it do to the lens model, right? So 
this, the point lens which I showed you a video of earlier, it has, so its lensing properties are described by the Einstein radius, which is the radius of that circle on the lens plane, which at these distances for a typical star is one micro arc second. So remember that the cluster lens scale is 12 arc second, so it's, it's very small. Right. And now let's paint this, paint a single star on top of this cluster lens. So this is the Jacobian of the cluster lens that I had shown you earlier, and paint a single star on top of it. So the Jacobian due to the star, you know, it, you just have an extra contribution that is related to this Einstein radius. And if you ask what are the critical curves of this system, that's where one of the eigenvalues of this matrix becomes zero. And that roughly satisfies this equation, where without this star, it would just be d dot x equals 0. That is that straight line. And now you have this extra thing. So the critical curves have a typical length scale of roughly the Einstein radius over the square root of d dot, the separation of the lens from the thing. So they are much, so the critical curves are super enhanced relative to the normal size, which would be theta star. Right, so I'll illustrate this in this movie of, I'm, I'm going to show the critical curves of a star that is moving across the fold, right? I can play it again, but so this is the critical curve of the cluster, and this is a single star that, you know, you're moving across, and you can note that these length scales are in units of the Einstein radius of the unperturbed star, so, it's, these critical curves are very large. And you can see that, so they grow as you, as the star approaches the curve, and then at some point they merge with the perturbations to the curve, and then it goes through and they detach again. So again, this is the, the critical curve of the star, which is now contributing micro lens right? Yes, yeah, so this, uh, the critical curves are a property of the complete system. So. This critical curve is largely determined by the star plus a simple external shear. And this critical curve is just the lens models thing. It's just when you happen to be close enough that both of them interact strongly. And you can also note that the orientations of these dumbbells changed. So that depends on the direction of the shear. So, or the reduced shear. So that changes depending whether you're here or here. So this is again showing the same thing again, except I've zoomed in a bit. So here is the length scale RC that I talked about, which is this Einstein radius over the square root of d dot, the separation. And as you move the lens closer, it becomes larger and larger and then merges at some critical value RC0. And then again, detaches as you move across, right? So, so you can ask, what is the separation at which they merge? and you'll get, you just equate RC to X, right? So this is roughly, this is all order of simple calculations. So you'll get a typical length, you'll get a typical separation from the critical curve RC0, which is where the critical curve starts getting disrupted by the point mass. So whenever you have a, a typical separation of micro lenses, you can define a typical surface mass density because surface mass density is just given by the mass per unit area. Right, so that gives you a critical kappa C, which is, which is telling you, if you distribute lenses with this kappa C, the cluster's smooth critical curve will be disrupted. Because that means then every RC0, there is typically a lens there. So for the typical lens model here, you'll get that this critical value is around 10 to the minus five. Right, if you, so it's, you'll need, you need very, very, small amounts of stars to completely destroy the smooth lens model. And if you remember, the inferred value of kappa star was around 0.01. So that means that the smooth lens model has been changed all over the, all over the critical curves and caustics because of the presence of these stars, right? So the typical sep separation between the lenses is given by their surface mass density, it's just Rs. And if you equate the typical separation between the lenses 
to the sizes of the critical curves, you will get that there is a band within which all the critical curves start merging. Beyond that, they are still isolated lenses. So the width of this band is roughly this kappa star over D. So it's, it's the, this, so this is a, giving you a characteristic width in the image plane beyond, you know, be, below which the micro lenses are super important, right? And just I'm illustrating here the critical curves by adding successively more micro lenses. So this is for adding micro lenses with kappa star of 0.2 kappa c. This is for 1 kappa c, and this is for 5 kappa c. You can see that progressively more and more of the critical curves are, you know, uh, perturbed by the lenses until when you go greater than kappa c, everywhere along the length, you you see you start seeing these this so-called corrugated network. And I've also plotted here the width that given by this formula. So let's now our now the task is to figure out what does this a kappa star of 0.01 do to the lens model. Right? So here I'm showing the not the kappa star of 0.01, but still a small value of kappa C. So this is like 20 kappa 17 kappa C. I'm showing you the critical curves for over different lens scales in the lens plane. So this is the unperturbed critical curve. So, sorry, this is the unperturbed critical curve. And then by adding my, so when you add micro lenses, you always have to take out some of the background mass so that you don't, you conserve mass. So that means that this, the lens model is actually the superposition of a smooth model with a different critical curve and the micro lenses. So you have a, so this is, you have a band of width RW beyond which the critical curves are all, they don't merge with each other. They are just isolated dumbbells. And inside this band, you, you have this network, right? And if you actually look deep inside the band, then you cannot see any vestiges of the original lens model in there. And if you ask what does it look like on the source plane, so since I have the curves on the lens plane, it's very simple to map them to the source plane. I just map them using the lens map. And I get a complicated curve. I'll just talk about this a bit. So this is the caustic of the background lens model. So that is this red solid line. And then I've added 17 kappa C of micro lenses on top. So relatively far from the caustic, the micro lenses, each of their critical curves, so each of their caustics looks like, you know, these diamond shapes. But then inside this band, the diamond shapes merge and form this network because, the, you know, they were merging there. So this is this band of, so when you take that width RW and go to the sense, uh, source plane, you get a width SW. But if you zoom in further, you'll see that these lines are not spaced uniformly. They're spacing is very low in the beginning. And then as you approach the caustic, macro caustic, more and more of these are bunched together. So the frequency of when you move across this, this plane, the frequency with which you hit these lines keeps increasing, but it doesn't increase arbitrarily. It increases, and it keeps increasing until some length scale SF, which I'll derive in a bit. Right? So all of these are you know, relevant scales if you want to understand the light curve of this event. So, in order to transfer, in, or, in order to transfer from the source plane, lens plane to the source plane, you need to know the deflection. So, the deflection is the sum of the deflection due to the lenses and due to the cluster. So, the deflection to the cluster is simple, but the lenses add a random component. So, given a particular realization of lenses, you can compute the deflection, but typically the deflection is some random variable, right? On the if you take a typical point on the lens plane, the deflection is the sum of the deflections due to all these lenses that are arranged and you can, you can go integrate over concentric circles and compute it. So there is a typical deflection scale, which is the deflection at, due to a single lens at the typical separation between the lenses, this so-called phi naught. So that, and if you ask for the distribution of this, this extra random deflection, over the various realizations of the micro lenses. It follows 
some stochastic distribution. So the stochastic distribution has a Gaussian core and a power law tail. So this Gaussian core is this law of large numbers. It will, you know, the, it, this is largely due to the combined effect of all the lenses that are, you know, in relatively far out. But since gravity is long range, when you do the integral, it turns out that it's not extensive. It depends on the number of lenses. It doesn't depend on just their density. But it does follow a Gaussian core. And the power law tail, which goes as one over deflection to the fourth, is because of you know, just unlikely close approaches by single lenses. And so this was first pointed out by Pechinsky and collaborators in 86. And you can work out the the typical standard deviation of the Gaussian core. So that is just this typical scale multiplied by Coulomb logarithm because you know you, when you do this integral, it's long range, right? So whatever is the scale, this scale is very small compared to the typical deflection due to the cluster, typically, except at certain places. So that's why when you transform to the source plane from the lens plane, you can always almost use the background model in order to compute quantities. So on this source plane, I, I, desc I described that there was this width of this, there was this band, which, which was this band of this, you know, corrugated curves. So this band has a width SW, which is just the image of this RW, which goes as the square of this density. And there is a time scale, tau W, which is the time a source takes to cross this band, which is uh, for, so if kappa star was kappa c, this would be 26 days approximately. And within this band, there are a large number of caustics whose number is approximately given by, which approximately scales as the uh, surface mass density to the three halves. And then the cost, as I mentioned, the caustics keep getting spaced closer and closer. So, and until they, their frequency peaks. Their frequency peaks when the stochastic deflection that I just talked about in the previous slide equals the cluster's deflection, right? So that it peaks, so this time scale is roughly 32 days if kappa star is kappa c. And at this point, the frequency of crossing is, you know, so I, I mentioned that it keeps rising, rising the, the frequency at which point source keeps hitting these lines. And, so it's roughly 25 per year if kappa star were kappa c. So for the physical value of kappa star, this SW is uh, roughly 20 parsecs on the source plane. So all the stars within that band, they will be hitting caustics, right? And this tau W is 10 to the five years. So a given star will take around 100,000 years to cross this band. And during this period, it will hit roughly 10 to the 4 caustics, or 10 to the 4 micro caustics. And this, the frequency at which it hits caustics, it peaks 10 years. This, this, this thing becomes 10 years. It peaks roughly 10 years before it crosses the caustic. And uh, finally, this crossing frequency is order 100. So at the peak, it's crossing caustics 100 times a year, roughly. Okay, so I think I've run through most of my time. So I'll, okay, uh, so much good stuff. Okay, <laughs> anyway, so I'll run through, I won't talk about the images or how I solve for them. So the, the another important qual, uh, quantity is the peak magnification. I mentioned that it was around 10 million for the smooth model, so for the, so this gradient D, it turns out that the micro lens is dominated, and they reduce the typical peak magnification to a few tens of thousands. So it will be like order 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4. And that peak frequency remains roughly constant within 20 parsecs. And then it falls off as roughly the 3 8th power. We also computed the mean magnification of these light curves. I'll just go, so, so the typical, so this is a, I'll just show how the light curves look like for, so this is the value kappa star is 17 kappa c. Remember that the true kappa c is, the, the true value of kappa 0.01 is around 500 kappa c. Since I can simulate easily smaller values, 
I just use them to verify the scalings that I just mentioned. And then we can predict how the real event looks like. Right, so the, you can see that the peak magnification, so this, this curve is the peak magnification that you would expect for the physical value of kappa c. It's a few times 10 to the 4, and it remains roughly constant within this band. But this band lasts for 10 to the 5 years. So this is just a very small slice. And also, the size of the source is not super important when it comes to determining how, you know, the, it, it determines the peak of the light curve. So this changes for different stellar radii. But other than that, you can solve the point lens and get away with it. Okay, I'll just show this video. Maybe it's a nice thing to show. I'm, I'm just showing how the, so the, the, the red points are the clusters images of the star, and the blue points are the images, micro images of the star as the star moves through the caustic. And the clusters images, you know, they, they, they generally form a cloud around the clusters images with roughly the same total magnification, but it fluctuates around wildly around it, as you can see. And towards the end, it becomes a long train of images, right? And you, I, I mentioned the observable, you know, time scales and magnification scales earlier. Right, we ve you can verify that using simulations. I won't talk about this. And I'll just briefly show you the, so it turns out that they did do observations of this. And you, so you can see this beautiful thing, which is, this is the critical curve. This is the knot I mentioned earlier. And then half, six months later, they also saw a knot at the other position. So this is not the time delay, but just it so happened that stochastically some of these micro images merged six months later, and these two things are roughly images of each other, so that these are the two image clouds approaching each other. And this separation is around 0.1 or 0.2 arc second. If you remember, that was the scale RW I told about, which is the length, width of this network. So it, is, it seems to be correct that you know, the, you know, this network is roughly 0.2 arc second across, so that means that the star is somewhere within the beginning of that 20 parsec band. And it should flicker once every year roughly now. And after 100,000 years, it will flicker many times. But there, the problem is the star is slightly too big, I think. So the colors, so this is the colors of this event. And you can, and they're, they're fit to, a, and they show the model spectrum of a B star. So another interesting thing is so if you look at the HR diagram, this, the presence of the micro lenses means that you will reduce the typical magnifications you see. So you will typically see stars around here, which if you have stars on the source plane that are these hot stars, they, they are not very long lived. They live around 10 mega years. They have surface temperatures of few tens of thousands of Kelvin, and they are 10 to 100 solar radius. So these stars would be observable in this particular thing. So you would see the tail of the luminosity function. And yeah, I can say more about it if people ask questions, but I'll leave my conclusions here. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, so the, in the observational paper, they, they had uh, sufficient observations so that they could take colors of the knot itself, which is, and they see, and they fit it to the, to the, they use FSPS to fit the observed colors to that 
of a star forming region with nebular emission and they find a reasonable fit yes yeah so i think it's correct Does that sort of nebular emission then extend effectively the size of the star and therefore change the Well, density? the nebular emission, so the surface brightness profile is dominated by the stars, right? So the nebular emission would not change the conclusions too much. Yes, I can show you that now. Yeah, so it's a bit, it's not a fundamental physics thing, so it's not very easy to separate it from observations. But any primordial black hole population who's, you know, in the space of the mass of the primordial black holes and the fraction, any, pri any population which lies above this wedge should have some observable effects. If you have high cadence light curves, it will, so these are all, I guess, quark nuggets or whatnot. Yeah, so, so these things would cause small, short period fluct, you know, fluctuations in the light curve if you could see them. For this particular event, I think it's a bit hard because it's a bit distant. So you only see the peaks of the peaks. So this, if you, and so to get any reasonable signal to noise, you have to co-add many of these things. So. But if you have other such events, yes, you would be able to make out short period fluctuations painted on top of the stellar microlensing because of these. Yeah. I'll ask one more quick question. What are the prospects then for looking at other um, critical surfaces yeah. in, in this or other yeah. clusters with low lensing and seeing many of these kinds of events? Yeah, so I, I think this is this is very new, right? I, I don't think people have typically looked at these deep observations and tried to chop them up and see which you know pixels are varying very much. But yes, it's definitely I think it would be interesting to, for example, look around all the critical curves and trying to try to find pixels that change that move out of that move. Uh, that uh, shift in luminosity significantly between observations. And uh, people are trying to do that now. Well, if there are no further questions, let's thank Tej again.